Good morning and welcome to our class on BC 110, a course on identity. Today we're going to study on, you know, the 11th section 11 on one body in Christ. So last class we start, we covered on section 10 where we, we, we identified ourselves, how blessed are we in Christ. So today we're going to look on one body in Christ how we have been identified as one body in Christ Jesus. So this is what we read in Galatians 3, 27 to 28 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have put on Christ. Praise God. So with keeping this in our mind, like, Lord, we are baptized in Christ and we have put on Christ. Right. So as we identify ourselves in Christ, let's look at God and let's pray, saying that, Lord, help us to understand this class as we are seeking you, as we, uh, you know, we seek you to understand that we can identify ourselves of being one in Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with thanks and praise. Lord, we pray that as we study today on being one body in Christ. Lord, we pray that we will identify, we will understand to identify ourselves in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that you will give us this understanding. You will expand our mind, expand our memory, that we may understand, we may get this revelation of being one body in Christ Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, we pray and we invite you in midst of us that you will help us understand. You will help us understand that how we are connected with you, how we can uh, understand and identify ourselves or each of us as one body in Christ. Thank you, Lord. We invite you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Just give me a minute. Okay. So let's turn to our uh, notes. We are on page 92. No, not page 92, sorry. Section 11. Let me move on. Which page are we in? Okay, we are on page 102. We are on page 102. Yes, Anand? Someone in the class trying to say something? Okay. We are on page 102, section 11. It talks about one body in Christ. So let's go together. So Galatians chapter 3. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 to 28. I read it for all. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what does it say? For as many of you were baptized into Christ. So we are into Christ. So here we see uh, that Paul is using a picture of baptism. And he is also illustrating what it means for us to have faith in Christ Jesus. So here he is not, uh, he, he, he is not saying about that we are baptized into water, but then he's making a point here that each of us are baptized into Christ Jesus. So just as in uh, uh, water baptism, a person is immersed into water, a similar manner, each of us are placed inside, are placed our faith in Christ Jesus. So we are immersed in Christ Jesus as one body. As one body, we each of us are within Christ Jesus. And the next verse talks about there is neither Greek nor Jew. 
There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For each of us all, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So here we see it's an amazing revolution that Paul is bringing to us. Because back then in the Galatian church, there were a lot of division. Division between the Jew and the Greek. Even in the last class we had discussed, there was a huge difference. There were huge misunderstanding between the Jew and Greek. So Paul is writing here that in Jesus Christ, that line is done away with each other. So we are one in Jesus. There is no Jew, nor Greek, nor any other denomination. We are one. We need to identify ourselves as one in Christ. So now that Jesus is our identity, that is more important for each of us. So this identity should be a priority. This identity where we identify ourselves in Christ should be a priority. Not a denomination, not a background, not a caste, creed or language. Nothing else should take place. There should not be any kind of division in the house of God. We should not identify ourselves with any other thing other than Jesus Christ. Why? Paul is illustrating here and he is mentioning it very clearly that we are all one in Christ Jesus. He is, uh, if you if if we read this passage again, we understand that he is not writing about a unity that comes out of a human achievement. But here he is saying that when people are saved by Jesus Christ, they are brought into this marvelous unity, a unity that is between uh, the saved and the Savior. A unity that binds all of us together when we are saved in Jesus Christ. He also discussed the same thing in the book of Colossians. Can we turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 11? Can I request one of you all to please read? Anyone from the class, use a mic to read Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, please. Anyone, even from the online, you can. Henry. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. For there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in, in all. Thank you, thank you, Ren. For there is neither Greek nor Jew, nor circumcised nor uncircumcised, nor any other denomination. The denominations that we have in our days is very clearly said. None of these denominations that we could identify ourselves with very clearly says, but Christ is all and in all. So our being is Christ and has made us one with everyone else who is in Christ Jesus. So here we see in this verse, Paul includes them saying, we are all one in Christ Jesus. He ends the statement saying, you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what should be our mindset? What should be our thought process? How can we identify ourselves in Christ? And how do we identify the others in the same family are in Christ? So our being in Christ has made us one with everyone else who is in the Christ. We are one in body. So this is what you do. This is the mindset that we need to carry. Our identity in Christ supersedes all our natural identity. It can be despite our racial, social, gender, uh, you know, any, 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 and any other denomination identity. Because these things will only lead into division, dividing the body of Christ. But then Paul is emphasizing time and again, let's not identify ourselves in any of these, but come together with 
one in Christ Jesus, so that we shall be one body in Christ. Can I may I request one of you all to please turn to Second Corinthians chapter five, verse sixteen and seventeen. Let's take turn. Let's each of us take turn to read the scripture so that we can understand. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. So what we understand here, we understand here is, Therefore, from now on, we regard one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer in flesh. But if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the old things have passed away and we have become new. So how do we become new? In our mind, in our spirit, in our inner being. So we do not know people after the natural sense but then we focus on who we are in Christ Jesus so we need to identify ourselves and others based on who we are in Christ Jesus with that we will move on to the next point which talks about God's dwelling place may I request one of you all to please turn to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 21 and 22 Anyone? In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. In whom the whole building being fitted together grow into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are all being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So each of us are a whole building. We need to be, we need to come together to grow as a holy temple in the Lord, so that we can build together the dwelling place of God in one in Spirit. May I request one of you all to please turn First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual law. So each of us are very important here. Uh, Peter says that you are not an ordinary being in the church of God, but you are the living stone. Each of us are the living stones where we have been used to build the spiritual house of God. And he also goes further and says, you are the holy priesthood where we offer spiritual sacrifice that is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what does it mean here? We are God's dwelling place in this earth, where we are to offer our spiritual sacrifice, the prayer, our meditation in the word, which would be an acceptable before God through Jesus Christ. So each one of us should identify ourselves as the Holy Temple. We are the temple of the living God. We need to believe this and identify ourselves. Can I request you all to put your hand on yourself say, I am the living temple. I am the living temple. And I, I identify myself as the living temple in the hand of God, in the house of God. Okay, let's just declare that over yourself. Let's move on to the next scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 
17. Can I request you all to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17? One Corinthians chapter three, verse sixteen to seventeen. Surely you know that you are God's temple, and that God's spirit lives in you. So if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you yourselves are His temple. Amen. It's very clearly Paul is saying in the book of Corinthians that as God's dwelling place, we establish God's presence in our community. How do we establish God's presence? Because we are the temple of God. When we are the temple of God, we are the carrier of God's presence. So how do we become the carrier of God's presence? When we, when we pray, when we meditate on the word of God, we become the carrier of his presence. When we become the carrier of his presence, we bring a change in the place where we are. We bring a change in our community. Why? Because we establish God's presence in our life. So as we see that, we will move on to every, uh, Psalms 132, verse 13 to 18. Psalms 132, verse 13 to 18. I will read it for all. But it says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. Listen. The Lord has chosen Zion, and he has desired it for his dwelling place. So the connection is made between the choice of David and his descendants. So we see God's, God's choice of Jerusalem as Zion. That has a sacred dwelling place, a place where he desires to dwell in. So what we see here, the Bible is based on the historical facts where it's very real. It involves real people, real events, real place. Why? Why do you think? It involves all real people, real events, real place. The historical facts are real. Why? Anyone from the class? Why do you think God involves real people, the real place? Why should God choose Zion, something that is on the earth? Why not heaven? And he says in the following verse 14, This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Look at that. God desires. And he also says in verse 15, I will abundantly bless a provision, and I will satisfy a poor with bread. 16 says, I will also clothe a priest with salvation, and the saints shall shout aloud for joy. And 17 says, there I will make the horn of David grow. That is, the descendant of David, or the leadership of David grow. Horn denotes leadership, the kingship. And I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon himself his crown shall flourish. That's what we see here. God could have chosen any place on this earth to be the stage on which you know all this drama uh, can happen. The redemption could have been displayed, but He deliberately chose Zion. Why? Because He wants Zion to be His dwelling place. He restricted Himself to Jerusalem and the land of Israel. Why? Because it is significant that this was the place that Lord desired. We see the Lord uh, chose Zion among many other places. So the human response was, uh, you know, all too often very cynical, treating God's choice as something to be exploited, a shelter against the judgment. But then God is saying, in the other scriptures also we see in the Old Testament, once the Ark of the Covenant that came into Jerusalem, there was to be no more traveling for the tabernacle because they rested in one place. You see, the tabernacle, uh, the temple and the altar and the ark would never rest in any other place 
other than Jerusalem. You see in one of uh, the scriptures, I remember reading it where uh, David says, I shall not rest until and unless I bring the Ark of the Covenant into the Jerusalem. So this was the joy of their soul. For surely that Lord will rest in this place. So it was God's desire for him to dwell in Zion. Now you and I are that Zion. You and I are that Zion in the New Testament where God desires to dwell in each of us. That's what Apostle Paul is saying, that you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And also we see Peter saying that we are the living stone, the temple of God, where God will dwell within us. So if the Lord is dwelling in us, His presence is in us. So we need to identify that presence. We need to identify that God desires to dwell in us. So we need to keep ourselves holy because the holy God is dwelling in us. We need to identify that we are the temple of God. Because we are the temple of God, we need to preserve ourselves from any infirmities or any kind of uh, iniquities or any kind of sin nature that could destroy this temple and God also says I will not spare the one who destroys the temple of God so we need to keep ourselves away from every worldly desires and keep ourselves pure let's desire and strive hard to keep ourselves pure because we are the temple of God and the most holy God is indwelling with us with that, we will move on to the next scripture, which, uh, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 to 17 and verse 21. Can I request one of you to please read? It talks about one bread and one cup. The cup of blessings which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ, for we... Though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the, of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Thank you. So we see Paul is talking about the cup of blessing, which we bless. So what is this cup of blessing? So the cup of blessing are not those who eat the sacrifice of the partakers of the altar. So Paul is making a point here. It says may seem obscure to us, unclear, but it was very plain to someone in that ancient culture. Just as the Christians uh, who lived their practice of this communion, which speaks about the unity and fellowship with Jesus, we need to know that they had this pagan culture where they used to have this pagan banquet which is given in honor of the idols that spoke of the unity with the demons who took advantage of this misdirected worship to eat in the presence of the pagan temple banquet where they had the fellowship with the altar um, of the idols. So what is Paul saying here? He's saying that an idol is anything or what is offered to the idol could be anything. They sacrifice to the demons. So Paul is acknowledging that an idol is nothing in the world. When we read 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, he says an idol is nothing in the world. Does he now say that the idols are actually demons? No, but he does say the demonic spirit takes an advantage of the idol who deceive and enslave him without knowing it where uh, the idol worshippers are glorifying demons in their sacrifice. So that's why he says you cannot partake of the Lord's table and take part of the law, a table of demons because people in those days in that culture they were actually coming to our uh, coming to our church, the synagogue, they used to call the synagogue, take part in the Lord's table. And they also used to go and take part in the temples, in the pagan culture, take part. So Paul is 
very clearly is making a statement here to them, saying that you cannot take part in both. So when Paul speaks of the Lord's table, he uses the term in contrast with the tables used in the pagan idol meals. So an ancient invitation to such a meal um, would read something like this. Okay, Some of the scholar has uh, written in such a way for us to understand what the people in those days in the Corinthians church, they were following. So Paul is trying to bring a correction and uh, the holiness or the importance of the Lord's table and making a correction in the people, trying to bring a discipline among them, saying that you cannot serve two masters. You cannot be in both the places. You need to reject the other and come into the Lord's kingdom. Okay, so he is illustrating. So what? For our understanding, I'm just reading an invitation that uh, that's how it read in those days. Okay, it says an invi invitation for the meals which they used to offer in the pagan culture, where like Charimon invites you to a meal at the table of Lord Seraphis in the temple of Seraphis tomorrow, the fifteenth, from nine o'clock onwards. Okay, this is how the invitation used to read. So if it means something to eat at the Lord's table, then it means something to eat at the table of demons. So you cannot choose both. So he's bringing a correction to the to the uh, people in Corinthians church that Lord's table is something holy and different from the table of demons. You need to reject that. And when you are here, you need to be here alone. So the Holy Communion of the Lord, it expresses that we are one body with Christ. So the scripture also says you cannot serve two masters. So when you receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior, when you take part in Lord's table, be here in one place. So this is what Paul is instructing the believers in the Corinthian church who were taking part in both the tables. And here you see, when we eat of one bread and drink of one cup, we are establishing a covenant with God, saying that, Lord, I have a covenant with you where I become one with you. That's what Jesus said. No, This is my body. Eat of it. Take part in my body. This is my blood. So that we can become one with Christ Jesus. So when we celebrate the blessing of the covenant, it expresses our unity with Christ Jesus, our unity with God, where we can say that I abide in you as you abide in me. Okay? Yeah. With that, we will move on to the next point. Many members, many functions. Can I request one of you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 8? Have many parts in the one body, uh, in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. In the same way, though we are many, we are one. We are one body in Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, we should do it according to the faith that we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. So many members in one body talks about the church who's unified whole as one body in Christ Jesus. So yet we are distinct within that one body, isn't it? So in, in the body of Christ, there is unity and not, but not uniformity. So we may have our difference. We may neglect each other's aspect, neither, uh, or we may uh, not be uh, united with our uh, thoughts. We have our own de uh, desires, which may be different from the other. But here, Paul is emphasizing, okay, on unity in Christ is something very essential part in our life. It is that the common ground. It is set as a common ground where we all, despite our difference, but despite our different thought 
process, we all can come into this one common ground where we are one body in Christ Jesus. And he talks about uh, having different gifts, where the gifts, uh, the difference and the distribution of gifts, uh, gifts is all because of the grace that is given to each of us. So here, Paul is talking about the spiritual gifts that are not same or not given to each of us based on our talent, on our skill, or on the merits that we carry. But God chooses to give each of us. So this is the idea that we relate in the uh, ancient Greek word for spiritual gifts is charismata, which means gift of grace. Gift of grace. So this term was apparently uh, combined what uh, Paul uh, uh, Paul emphasizes that giving of the spiritual gifts was all of grace. So what does he say here? The spiritual gifts are given at the discretion of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit decides whom to give what. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, we say that, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each individual as he wills, as God decides or desires to give each one. So what we need to understand here, as we are part of one body, we need to recognize that there are many members and have many functions in the same body. But then we need to come together with one mind and God to serve each other. So though there are many members and many functions, but we are united in Christ Jesus for one purpose, to serve each other. So this is what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 27. Okay, uh, 12 to 27, but I'll just read that which is important. Okay, we'll read maybe the first... Uh, verse like 12 to 14 I'll read for as the body is one and as many members but all the members of that one body being many are one body so also in Christ verse 13 says for one for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body where Jew or Greek were slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So what do we learn here? Though we are many in member, how we come along with one body, one mind, to serve Christ. It also talks about you may be a Jew or a Gentile. That does not matter. Whichever denomination you are in, whichever caste, creed, language you are from, doesn't matter. You are one in spirit where we are all baptized into that one body in Christ Jesus. We take part in the Lord's table as one in spirit. So we should learn to serve together. So when you read the uh, passage, uh, Paul explains it very clearly that we can understand. We all suffer together as one member. So when one member suffers, all the members suffers with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Why do we do that? Because we are one body with Christ Jesus. We are one body with Christ Jesus. So we need to learn to serve together, complement each other. And there's nothing for us to compete with another. Though we are independent with each other, but we must honor and respect every member who is in Christ Jesus. God has given this great honor to those who do not receive honor. So we need to honor and respect each other because we are in Christ Jesus. We are the Christ. We are the church of the living God. We are that holy temple. Can I request you all to turn to Galatians chapter 1 verse 22? Can I request you all to read Galatians chapter 1 verse 22? Galatians chapter 1 verse 22. 
and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. Thank you. So Paul is writing to the church of Galatians, and he's also explaining to us that he was unknown by face to the church of Judea, which were in Christ Jesus. So he's saying that the unknown in certain different from our own habit of, uh, you know, of, of fame. You know, we try to become very prominent when we get into the ministry. We try to see to ourselves like how we can promote ourselves, how we can promote our name with our picture. You see, Paul was in the Lord, but he was obscure. He took his time to meditate on God's word. And then even when we, when he came to the ministry, when he started preaching and teaching, people recognized him as, hey, he is the one who betrayed us before. He was one who betrayed us, killed us. But still, Paul served when, you know, obscurity. That's why he writes here, you may not know me by face, but people recognized him by the teaching, by the teaching, by his letters. They have not met him face to face. But then they have heard a man who betrayed Jesus Christ, who betrayed the believers in Jesus is now proclaiming, is now preaching the good news. So his word, the teaching of Paul became very prominent more than himself or more than his, uh, more than his uh, name or his face. So Paul was happy and he was well served to spend many years that way serving God and uh, you know, uh, allowing the teaching of God to go further, not his name or his face. We also read in First Thessalonians chapter two, verse fourteen. Can I request you all to please turn to First Thessalonians chapter two, verse fourteen? I all, yeah. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse fourteen. For you, brethren became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from Judeans. OK. So for you, brethren, became imitators of churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. So what is, what is Paul trying to say to the church of Thessalonica? He says, when the Thessalonians responded to the gospel, they became the target of persecution. The minute you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and your life gets changed, transformed, and you set yourself apart from the others, you see, you become the target for the others. So as they did there, they were not alone because, so Paul is instructing the uh, church in Thessalonica, it's not just you alone who is facing the persecution, but even the other places where people have received Jesus as the Lord and Savior, they have set themselves apart, they have stopped following any of their pagan culture or been worshipping the pagan gods, even there the people are suffering. So he makes a point that you're just not alone who are going through this persecution, but even the other churches of God have been suffering the persecution. So the Thessalonian Christians became the imitators of those who are suffering before them. So they they try to get this understanding through Paul's letter saying that, okay. So it's not just we who have changed our life, who have received, who have become the followers of Christ, who are facing such problem, but they are even the other churches in the places are going through this and they look at their life, how they are enduring this persecution, how they are enduring this uh, suffering. So they try to become the imitators. That means they try to follow that. They try to follow that, they try to observe that, they try to apply that in their life. So the Thessalonians are willingly suffering the same thing because they were convinced what Paul was teaching. 
that he was not teaching from the word of a man but he's trying to teach from the word of god because christ himself who came into the world he didn't he didn't uh, jesus didn't come into the world for others to serve him but then he served others did jesus face persecution yes he did face persecution did he suffer yes he suffered did he uh, was he uh, did he die on the cross for the teaching for the kingdom of god yes he did so you and i when we are in christ jesus we may suffer certain persecutions in our life we may be neglected we may be looked down at our workplace in our ministry in our family why because we are in christ jesus our lifestyle is different we are different. We don't gossip like how others gossip. We don't treat others uh, for evil for an evil. But then the scripture says, treat others evil for good. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't be part of any gossip. Don't, uh, don't have a joy in others' suffering. You see, there's so much different in the lifestyle. So when we are in Christ, our life changes from within a thought process changes we don't enjoy doing the worldly things we don't enjoy with another person suffering we tend to be part of it so the lifestyle is different and for this it may be persecuted we may be ridiculed we may be looked down but then be encouraged with each other saying that those who are in the lord will suffer such things but hold on to lord hold on to the word of god because the word it's not the word of man but it is a word of god so this is what uh, the thessalonians believe that paul is not bringing the word of man but he's bringing the word of god because the word of man isn't worth suffering for but for the word of god because it is a true message from god so it is worth it for us to hold on to it for us to follow it so we need to honor other local churches that are in christ jesus because although there's difference in our expression the way we worship god but then we are one church in christ jesus we are one church in christ jesus so we need to remember that lord we are one in your body we are one in your body one in Christ, though we may function differently, but we are one body in Christ Jesus, just like how we are we have different parts of our body, but it all functions together. Nothing refuses this. Uh, my right hand does not say that I will not support my left hand or I will not support to you know the food to reach about so many other things. Okay, but here Paul is bringing a very good illustration of our own body, saying how each and every different function different purpose but they all work together for that one body the similar manner though we are different in our nature and our expression but we all come together in one in christ and the very purpose of that is to glorify god so this should be in our mind when we identify believers in christ despite the caste creed culture denomination we need to honor them saying we are one body in christ so how do we honor that we are one body in christ we need to focus we need to see what is common in us what is common what is common is we have accepted jesus christ as our lord and savior he is our god he's our savior he came down on this earth he died on the cross so we have expected so these are certain things that are common so discuss on the common things accept on the common things look at each other respect honor each other on the common ground and don't get into any kind of dispute or disagreement on the other doctrines which they have developed within them refuse it don't talk about it because christ is looking at the unity in the body of christ the enemy may focus, may bring uh, bring to our mind, okay, let's discuss on the other differences. But when we discuss what happens, there's a dispute, there's a division, and the body of Christ may get divided. But then the Lord Paul is instructing us, discuss on the common ground, come together, 
worship God together, be in one mind and one body, be in unity in that one body. So this is something that we need to look into for us to be unity in one body so that we can worship Christ, we can worship God in one body in Christ Jesus. So last class we studied on how blessed we are in Christ Jesus and this class we focused on how we are one body, how we can identify ourselves and others in that one body in Christ. And in next class we can discuss on section 12 where each of us are ministers and ambassadors in Christ Jesus. Okay, so with that, we will end this session with a word of prayer. And then I know Nina has posted a question. We can discuss on that. But let's end this class with a word of prayer because of time. Dear God, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. We honor you. We worship you, Father. Lord, I pray that you will expand our mind and our heart, that we may identify ourselves and others so that we are one body in Christ Jesus. Despite our differences, oh Lord, help us to identify each other, each of us, that common ground, that we are one in Christ Jesus. We are the child of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to identify ourselves the God sent His only begotten Son because you love the whole world despite the people from different faiths. They may be a Jew, Greek, Gentile, whichever background, but you love them. You sent your only begotten Son to die on the cross for each of us. When you have this big picture, Lord, Help us to have that big picture even in ourselves, oh Father, that we may love others as Christ loved. Lord, I pray that as we study each, each week, Lord, in each class, we pray that we will learn to identify ourselves in you. Just not by identifying ourselves, but our heart and mind to receive the Christ nature, the likeness of Christ, so that we may love each other and be united in Christ to love each other so that we can be in that one body of God. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. So in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, class, for joining in today's session. God bless. God bless. Thank you. I'll just stop the recording.